This school began in 1857. We were founded originally to cater to the Anglo-Indian children who lived in the Anglo-Indian colony next to Sea Alder Station. So 1857, most of the area around here was jungle, and this was called Sea Alda, which is the Garden of the Foxes. Well, I came with the intention of staying for life because I felt called by God to come to India. I was a young sister, just 20, and we had lots of sisters here. We're here since 1841. This was my first superior. I had her from the age of seven to the age of 12, and then she came to India as the first provincial. Uh, we had always run these very good schools. We had always had poor schools alongside, but mostly for Catholic children. One of the things we were supposed to do was see, judge and act. You know, see what the situation is, make a judgment on what you should do and then take action. And I said, well, we're here inside in this beautiful convent. There's nothing to see. So I took the children and we went outside. And outside the gates I found such poverty. I realized we're running something parallel and we're ignoring what is a very, very heavy responsibility which we don't even see as ours. From 1964, I had been very concerned about the poor children, about whom nobody seemed to be bothering much. And we were running our lovely schools, and I felt very uneasy at this. Initially, we had two schools running here. One was the free school for children from very, very financially deprived backgrounds. And the rest of the school was for children who could pay fees. And in the few years, the poor children had been leached out almost entirely. So I set myself to bring back the poorest children to have one section 50% poor and 50% well off. First year I was here, some Catholic lady's neighbor, who was a Muslim, said, do you think if I bring my little daughter, sister will take pity? So that was the very first Muslim mm. child that I took in from a poor background. And then after that, the word got round, must have got round in all these busty areas. Here's a school that might consider us. And now they come quite normally. They all make their application and they sit with the well-off people. And then the children themselves, we take by lottery. So but there's no exam, so there's no uh, competition to get in. It's just your luck if you get in. <laughs> The first thing I tried to do when I came here was to do a survey of the children on the street who were in great need. And I prepared the children, the school and the teachers. They came back and they said there are no poor children on the street, they're all quite fat. They could not recognize the signs of malnourishment in swollen bellies and swollen limbs. And I realized that I was too soon. They were not at all prepared. They were living in here in a very nice setup totally unconscious of what was going on outside. And so I thought the best thing to do would be to get the children out into the villages first. And then perhaps from there we could come back into the city.
I began taking them out every week into the villages. They handle about 3,500 children in village schools every Thursday, which is the school holiday. I send out 150 children. Every child sacrifices one school holiday a month to go out into the villages and to teach the children. got 120 little kids in a primary school of all different ages from 5 to 10 and you're a lone master with 120 children, what do you do? Even the very best of teachers, I mean we, are, we go out to the villages and we see that these teachers are very devoted, very capable. I see the, like in that uh, school where we teach English, 147 girls and one teacher packed into a classroom. Then we had other schools where 860 children and five teachers. 1,600 boys and girls up to class 12 and 12 classrooms. It's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle because the government, there are 51,780 primary schools in West Bengal alone, 51,000. So like the, the numbers are just oh, behind them. Yeah, You've got millions of children. And I learned to consult the people that we're working for, to go there as people offering, you know, to be friends and then see how together we can solve problems. Not to go in with a service and say, we're the great ones and we're going to do it, you know? 51, 52, 52, 53. And the first thing the um, villagers asked me, the masters of those schools, why have you come here? You know, why are you here? Uh, and I said, well, I'm here because I have a conscience. We're in the city, the government gives us funding, we're allowed to take uh, fees from the children, we run very good schools. And I come out here and I find you in little hovels of schools that even you wouldn't put cattle into, uh, no fans, no lights, no facilities of any kind, hundreds and hundreds of children to one master. And I said, anybody with a conscience has to think about collaborating with you and offering you whatever assistance we can offer you and equalize the situation. So that satisfied them. They were very happy then. And one actually said to one of my teachers, has she come to convert us? So this particular teacher was a Hindu and she said, well, I've been working with the Loretta nuns for 25 years and I must say I love Jesus, but no one has ever asked me to convert. From class 5, we've been doing this thing, so we are experienced in this. We don't really have to take any trainings and all. No, I won't be a teacher. <laughs> it's just an experience, and this is a school. We have to share every experience. Anushka Mitra, Neha Maria Gupta. All over the world, you have thousands and thousands of secondary school kids who could easily make the whole rest of them literate and benefit a lot in the process, no? Now, after the children had been out in the village, going out week by week from 1979 to about 84, they came to me and they said, you know, we're going out so far to the villages and we're not seeing the children in front of us on the street. Now, they got the chance to see those children in 79, but their eyes were closed. It was only when they went out to the villages and they began to get more and more experience of the poverty of the children in front of them.
So I said, fine, if you want to start a program for the children on the streets around here, go out and do it yourselves. I only give you two basic um, rules. One is you're not to offer them anything by way of material, food or anything else. Uh, and you're not to change their capacity to survive. So they brought them in. They went out in the afternoons uh, over towards the station, all along the footpaths. They talked to the parents, they talked to the children. They said, we're only children ourselves, but we could invite you in. You could come to our school in the afternoons and we could teach you. And slowly, slowly, the children began to come in. Then they began to come earlier and earlier and they were tumbling around on the playground playing with the little ones coming out from school. Parents were standing there watching. Nobody raised an objection. So gradually I encouraged them to come earlier and earlier and slowly then I felt, you know, we could have them in school the whole time. Every child in our school has two periods of work education per week on their timetable. So we ended up with a reservoir of 50 potential children coming from the regular school free and ready to teach whoever came to the school. I am teaching them to with rice to make alphabets. They sit down on a one-to-one -one basis with the children and they prepare them. The first thing we do is to make them literate. We give them a baseline data test whereby we ascertain what uh, letters do they know of the alphabet, can they count, can they add, can they subtract and so on. And then once we know what their current knowledge is, then we build on on that. We have developed many innovative methods by which the children can learn faster. And then we shift them onto books and then we push them as fast as they're ready to go. And say an 11-year-old child can be ready for regular school uh, within about a year of joining the programme. My name is Agnes Tinky James. I'm in the 12th standard and will be appearing for my boards next year. This is my house. This is my very small house. This is the kitchen. No, this is the house. This, this is the house. And uh, if it's raining? If it's raining, we cover the thing with the plastic and all we stay under that. Agnes Rinky James is actually the youngest of three sisters and all three were here. When they first came to us, they were living under a staircase. Then later on, they graduated onto a tiny little uh, place up on the a roof. I think I'm one of the luckiest person that I've been selected as one of the 700 students to get the scholarship and I'm being able to study. I would like to become a model or work in a bank. So either of the options and I like collecting posters of my favorite actors and all. I like singing. My parents, I don't think they would have been able to cope up with my educational expenses. Because nowadays the money is so high that I don't think they would be able. And that too, we are from a very poor background and Sister Cyril had supported us so they had influenced us all. We are very, very, very grateful to her, that's it. Every year we take in about 100 new children into nursery, that's English medium. 
Now those hundred will be 50% from the very poorest like this child and 50% from families able to pay the fee. She's done a lot for me. So she's just asked us for the children who are not being able to study properly, who are not, means coping up with the class, if we could spend two hours for them and make them study. And we're always ready to do that. First do your correction, then we'll do with English. And you... You do it! You have to do your own correction. She won't show you because in your exams you're not going to pass like that. So many children coming in from well-off families will never touch the lives of these poor children unless they go into their houses as domestic slaves. By bringing these children into the heart of the school, having them mix with the regular kids, having them stand at assembly, having them get up and take assemblies in front of the regular kids, you break down all those barriers. People begin to see them, they're just the same as us. And once that's broken down, it will never come back in the lives of those other girls. They'll always see people as equals. I have not just brought all these children